Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're honored to be sitting down today with a, a, um, prestige, a prestigious gentleman at the Document Foundation, Italo Vignole. And thank you so much for joining us today, Italo. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. So if you could um, maybe dive in to the, what the Document Foundation is, what Libre Office is, and what the philosophy behind the organization is in general. Okay, so uh, the Document Foundation uh, is, a, is a not-for-profit. It's based in Germany, uh, but in general, the, the organization is, sim is very similar to a 501 uh, incorporated in, uh, in the States. Uh, it's, uh, it's a foundation that was born uh, out of uh, an open source project in uh, 2010, so 10 years ago. Uh, the community that was uh, uh, contributing to OpenOffice, uh, after the uh, acquisition of Sun Microsystem, that was the main sponsor of OpenOffice, by Oracle decided that it was probably a good idea to become independent from uh, from large corporations. So we technically did uh, a fork of the software. The software is open source, so it's a, it's a common uh, practice, uh, not so frequent, but rather common uh, to take uh, the entire uh, source code, uh, duplicate it on, uh, on an, another server, and start from there uh, developing uh, a new product, a new product with uh, additional, different, uh, better features. Of course, this depends from, uh, from the developers. And uh, a product that is uh, different from the original one. So when uh, we decided to create the, this project, uh, the uh, one of the main reasons, as I said, was to be independent from uh, large corporate sponsor. Of course, we don't have uh, anything against uh, large corporate sponsor, but uh, we know, and this uh, is based on our previous experience, that when a project has a single large corporate sponsor, um, let's say that the muscles of these large corporate sponsors, every now and then uh, they show up uh, and uh, they always try to um, convince community uh, and volunteers uh, to, to contribute in, in a specific direction which is something that volunteers do not like. A volunteer is someone that um, is using his own free time to contribute to a project for uh, many different reasons. First, because it's, um, it's often fun. Second, uh, because of the relationship with other people project uh, uh, based on a community, of course, uh, have a large um, number of interactions. And this is a challenge, but it's also a very nice experience and a very um, um, positive experience for, for the people. And, uh, and then uh, uh, they, they, they want to have uh, to do what they like, uh, which is of course uh, absolutely legitimate. If you if you use your own free time, you use it to do what you prefer, what you like. So of course, uh, developers uh, uh, may like developing uh, different things from what they are uh, paid to develop during uh, during office time. Um, people uh, uh, doing documentation can uh, challenge themselves in, uh, in doing something different from uh, their pay time and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, uh, an open source project has, has um, 
room for everyone. It's, uh, it's like a large uh, corporation where uh, uh, most of the activities are done by volunteers. Volunteers are uh, usually fantastic, but on the other hand, they have a very peculiar characteristic that many large corporations do not understand. You cannot fire a volunteer. You cannot hire a volunteer, and uh, you hire it uh, by word of mouth, by motivation. But you cannot. But what is absolutely true, you cannot fire it, uh, the volunteer. The volunteer can stay there as long as he likes. Uh, you cannot tell someone uh, go away because we don't like what you do. Uh, you cannot convince uh, a volunteer to do something different from uh, what he wants to do. And uh, Sun, uh, in some cases, wanted to um, invited was inviting volunteer to do what they preferred. For instance, I I am not a I don't have a technical background, so I I've started in open source based on my previous uh, marketing uh, uh, experience and uh, when I when I started to help the open office project in Italy I started to send out uh, uh, to write and send out press releases which is something that I've done uh, not full-time but part-time for almost 40 years now of my life so uh, I started to send out press releases and the Italian media were picking up uh, my press releases and they were not picking up uh, Sun, press Sun PR agency press releases. And this, of course, uh, started to make the PR agency nervous. And uh, so the marketing manager at Sun uh, became nervous as well. And he, he called me and said, you should stop sending out press releases. And I said, OK, you can fire me whatever, whenever you want, uh, but we cannot fire you. OK, so you cannot stop me sending out press releases and if my press releases are better than yours sorry but the media will pick up mines and not yours and that was the story uh, and um, so we 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 really wanted to be independent uh, not to have anyone trying to convince us to do uh, different things from what we were uh, wanted to do we created the Document Foundation and uh, Open Office uh, in, in our project became uh, LibreOffice. LibreOffice uh, is an open source uh, office suite, uh, is a product rather similar to uh, Microsoft Office. Uh, we have uh, three main components, uh, which are uh, Writer, the equivalent of Word, um, calc, the equivalent of Excel, and uh, Impress, the equivalent of PowerPoint. We don't have an email package because there's plenty of email packages in the open source environment. And uh, we have a design module that is called uh, Draw, uh, which is missing uh, in Microsoft Office. But this because the two products uh, have a different history. Um, what is today LibreOffice was born in Germany in the 80s, uh, more or less at the same time when uh, uh, Word was born uh, in the States. So the, the two products have evolved in a, in a different way with different uh, uh, development strategies behind them. Uh, they are very similar in terms of functions uh the difference of course is to use open microsoft office you have to buy a license to use libreoffice uh, if you are an individual uh, you just download it on and install on on your computer if you are an enterprise uh, uh, we you can uh, uh, use it for free but we definitely suggest uh, to uh, to get uh, a long a supported version 
from a company that provides uh, professional support to what uh, is uh, usually needed by an enterprise to to run uh, a software uh, on uh, multiple uh, multiple personal computers uh, so that is uh, this is more or less the 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 story uh, we we are uh, after 10 years uh, the of course the environment has changed uh, we 10 years ago google docs uh, was barely uh, known uh, and today is a very large product uh, microsoft uh, has launched uh, uh, office 365 uh, which was not there 10 years ago uh, and uh, uh, there is there are products uh, for tablets uh, and for um, smartphones there are products for the cloud we libreoffice is available uh, on the cloud and is available on uh, on uh, smartphone and tablets uh, but because of the um, nature of open source uh, these products are not released uh, directly by the document foundation but by partner companies so for instance uh, the version for mobile is called collabora office and there is also something similar on the cloud called collabora office or something like that um, this is perfectly normal because uh, these companies that provide LibreOffice to enterprises or to specific markets are contributing uh, the software uh, uh, to the community. So the, the reality is that the software at the end is the same. Uh, in specific market, uh, you get uh, added value support. Uh, in uh, the end user or individual user environment uh, you can use uh, your uh, the, the software uh, without uh, specific support uh, and uh, the community provides uh, a professional in term of contents but non-professional in term of timing uh, support uh, what, what means this uh, it means that the people uh, are very knowledgeable but being volunteers, uh, they may answer two days after the question, which is something that may is probably okay for uh, for an individual, is definitely not okay for uh, for a large enterprise that has to produce uh, contents uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, the characteristic of LibreOffice uh, are uh, um at the end uh, more or less the same of uh, microsoft office uh the different there are a few difference uh, uh, which are uh, interesting because uh, the localization so that the translation of the software are done by volunteers libreoffice is available in a in more languages than microsoft office actually we release uh, 120 different language version today and there are another 25 i think uh, in the works so libreoffice uh, uh, in in the future but i cannot predict uh, this future uh, may be available in up to over 140 different languages many of these languages are uh, languages of minorities or endangered languages that risk uh, to disappear so there is also an interesting uh, ethical uh, um, point of view about open source software being uh, capable of uh, protecting the uh small languages uh, from disappearing uh, by providing a version uh, on pcs uh, so that uh, people that speak uh, natively that language can use uh, 
the personal computer in their own language. Uh, uh, just to make an example, there is one language spoken in South America. Uh, the name of the language is uh, Guarani. And the language is spoken uh, in Paraguay, in uh, uh, the northern part of Argentina, in a small part of Brazil, and uh, uh, just uh, in uh, the south of Bolivia. Uh, this is a language that has no other software that can be used uh, in Guarani. So we, the project is working with the University of Asuncion in Paraguay to keep uh, the localization uh, up to date in a way that uh, all the native people that are uh, speaking Guarani as their native language and uh, have a little bit of knowledge of Spanish, which is the official language of the other official language of Paraguay, can uh, uh, feel at ease uh, when uh, using the computer. You can imagine uh, uh, using uh, uh, the, the computer and having the interface uh, in a language that you barely know uh, is not uh, an an easy an easy task of course uh, uh, native english speaker are lucky in this sense because uh, all computers understand english because that is the lingua franca of technology so everyone uh, is using uh, english to develop the software but uh, uh, this is not true for uh, for all the users worldwide and especially for users in uh, countries which are uh, slightly underdeveloped or um, with a uh, lower income, uh, general income uh, than, uh, than larger countries. And the second peculiarity of LibreOffice is that LibreOffice is using uh, a document format uh, which is uh, standard. Uh, is called Open Document Format, uh, is recognized by ISO uh, and uh, is uh, not only recognized by ISO, but is implemented according to ISO, uh, to ISO guidelines, uh, which is not true for uh, Microsoft Office uh, format because uh, it is recognized by ISO, but is not implemented according to ISO uh, guidelines. So uh, what, what that this means, uh, it means uh, that uh, the documents are standard. And uh, if you use a standard, uh, uh, you can exchange the document uh, in a completely transparent way with other users uh, of the same format, uh, independently from uh, the computer or the device they are using, independently from uh, the language of their computer or device, independently from the operating system. For instance, uh, I, I am an, a Linux user, so my normal computer is a Linux computer, Linux Mint computer, and my phone is an Android phone. And I access and edit exactly the same file on the computer and on the phone. But not only uh, when I use the English user interface, but also when I use the Italian user interface. So if I have the computer with the Italian user interface and the phone with the English or vice versa, I don't see any different uh, in uh, in the format. And uh, if I exchange the file with someone using uh, Windows, uh, uh, even a legacy version of Windows, or someone using Macintosh, the, 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 the document is uh, exactly the same. And this is a big advantage in terms of uh, um, user uh, management of uh, contents, because uh, once uh, the uh, the user generated contents are in a standard format the user can be sure that they 
are available today and will be available in the future because the standard format has a description and uh, uh, every developer will be able if uh, the the tool is missing to develop uh, uh, a tool that allows the user to read uh, the document of course uh, it is this is not necessary on normally because the users uh, can rely on a software that is already existing but in 100 year for instance we don't know if LibreOffice will be around still uh, we hope so but who knows but the documents uh, will uh, be always uh, compliant uh, to the standard and the standard will be there because uh, is uh, registered by ISO and is available for everyone at no cost so this uh, is a very important uh, feature uh, almost uh, unknown outside uh, Microsoft Office users, uh, but is uh, really key. Uh, and uh, for instance, there are governments like uh, the government uh, of uh, Taiwan, the government of uh, the United Kingdom, government of France, government of the Netherlands, um, and Sweden and Portugal, who have a law that mandates uh, the public administration to use this kind of standard format because uh, uh, having a standard format uh, with a free implementation allows you allows the citizen to exchange the document with the public administration without uh, being forced to buy a software or to buy a computer uh, or a specific tool because the standard compatible uh, tools are available almost on uh, every platform. So I think uh, that that's uh, quite a long introduction, but I've covered uh, most of the topic. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have another question, but I can go further yeah. for uh, days speaking about LibreOffice. Great. Well, thank you, Italo. That was definitely a very uh, in-depth introduction to the the foundation and LibreOffice. I'm curious, could you discuss a little bit about its history? I know that early on it was, I believe, uh, an early member of the openoffice.org community, which was the precursor to the, to the document foundation, was Sun Microsystems, and yeah. then it evolved into a more open source, or at least a, uh, a it, it, it evolved a away from its origins with uh, Sun Microsystems and then um, Oracle Corporation, which had purchased Sun Microsystems. Could you discuss that evolution and, and what the difference between the Document Foundation and then its early um, its early form was? So the, the Open Office project uh, uh, was... Uh, uh, we can say it was a was a satellite of Sun uh, Microsystem. There was no foundation for the Open Office project. Uh, Sun Microsystem uh, did uh, uh, an extremely good job uh, during the first years of the project because uh, when uh, Open Office uh, was uh, released as open source uh, in the year two thousand, there was no open source community around uh, personal productivity. There were open source software, but they were mostly server side. So the kind of software that end users are not uh, even, uh, uh, that they're not see, they don't see, and uh, they using them indirectly. Uh, open Office was the first one, uh, was the first, uh, software installed on on user pcs that was uh, open sourced and uh, uh, so sun helped the community to grow uh, organizing the first conferences and providing uh, the first uh, the infrastructure for the community but as i said before uh, uh, when the community started to become more mature they did this happened 
around 2005, 2006. Then Sun started to resist a little bit uh, uh, against the community, not in an hostile way, but trying to tell the community, you know, we have always uh, done this way, so why we should do it in a different way, even if the majority of the community agrees on the different way. And this started to create some... Uh, some small frictions, nothing terrible, but the the community started to think about uh, uh, launching an independent foundation. So when uh, Oracle uh, uh, announced the acquisition of Sun in 2009, it was uh, uh, rather clear that Oracle uh, uh, would not uh, invest uh, in a number of products. Uh, some people in the community, they were convinced that Oracle would have maintained uh, uh, open office, uh, but others, and uh, I was probably one of the most uh, skeptical, <coughs> were almost sure that open office was not in, in Oracle plans. So we we decided to wait uh, the uh, the open office uh, event that in uh, 2009 was organized in in italy in orvieto so i was one of the organizer and uh, we uh, we the 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 point that we decided to use as a to evaluate uh, Oracle commitment was uh, to, uh, to to see uh, to 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 see the, the, the Oracle representative of, at the com at the conference. So I've uh, worked uh, in large American companies for uh, quite a while in in my in my uh, life in my business life. So uh, I, I told the others, uh, if uh, they send someone uh, with a budget responsibility, so someone with some money to spend, that means that they're interested. Because, uh, uh, of course, if uh, they put some money on the table, uh, this means that they want to keep uh, the, the, the project running. If they send someone uh, without budget responsibility, almost for sure, they will drop the product sooner or later. So the uh, the guy that they sent uh, was a very nice guy. Uh, we had fantastic beers uh, in uh, in and, and wines in in Orvieto, but it was impossible. Uh, talk with him uh, of anything uh, money related because uh, he, he he said uh, uh, I don't have a budget so I cannot discuss uh, and uh, I uh, I will report to my bosses uh, uh, which is uh, the, the between the line message to say uh, you know it's a uh, is not I in the in the priorities, and uh, so we we decided in in early two thousand and ten. I remember that the first uh, call at the time there were not conference calls like uh, or video conference call like this, but we were uh, using a phone conference. Uh, um, um, services. The first uh, phone conference was in uh, in January 2010, and uh, we announced the project uh, on uh, September 28, 2010. So we announced uh, after uh, 10 months. I remember 2010 was uh, like a crazy year because we, in 10 months, we put together everything uh, 
around the project so we we decided about the name the foundation uh, etc uh, we decided about roles uh, we decided about the structure we wrote the statutes uh, we decided to incorporate it in germany for historical reasons uh, so it was a uh, an interesting time and uh, we we uh, we got our freedom from uh, from sun and um, short after we announced uh, the the project uh, oracle announced uh, that they were uh, dropping uh, uh, open office and uh, because of a previous contract they had with ibm they decided uh, because this is what ibm asked them to uh, give uh, the open office code to the apache foundation and not to our project uh, simply because uh, uh, ibm uh, uh, doesn't like the community and uh, didn't want uh, to deal uh, with the community so uh, the company uh, I hope they have changed now that they have uh, uh, acquired uh, Red Hat uh, and uh, Jim Widerst, uh, former Red Hat CEO, is the, now the CEO of IBM. But let's say that IBM uh, is not definitely not in the top position uh, in my ideal list uh, of companies. Let's say that it's very close to the bottom in this sense. Uh, it was not nice uh they try to uh put a lot of pressure on uh on us uh using uh, um, every potential uh, tool that they had uh and let's say that this has not left uh, good memories uh, in uh, in quite a large number of people uh so the the difference is that the let's say that the we is like we have graduated the pro the the project uh, being independent uh, from uh, a first uh, uh, generation of non-independent contributors to a second generation of totally independent contributors uh, and a project that is uh, uh, clearly self-sustaining uh, based on uh, contributions from companies, from volunteers, and from uh, organizations. Uh, of course, uh, we could do better, but I think uh, that uh, none of the founders after 10 years uh, would even uh, bet to be where we are today. That's great. Now I'm curious. Now, what is surprising, ironic, novel, or even controversial about the Document Foundation and LibreOffice? And then, why would users use uh, LibreOffice over the other options uh, when it comes to, say, writing? So there's two questions there. Like, what's surprising, ironic, novel, or controversial about um, the Document Foundation? And we can start there uh of course the you know the the i don't think there is nothing uh really controversial nothing uh, is just a different kind of open source project are just a different kind of project so uh, people that are not uh, familiar with open source uh, uh, would probably see open source in a with a with a very skeptical high at first one of the questions that i i asked more frequently is uh, uh, where uh, are you making money and uh, uh, the reality is that uh, we are not making money we we are supported by donations donations allow us to 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 manage the project and the infrastructure. This involves uh, paying uh, some people. I'm one of the person that is uh, paid for part of his time. Um, 
and uh, uh, there are companies which are uh, uh, inside the project uh, when it comes to development so they develop together with the volunteer developers and they are uh, just uh, immediately outside the project when it it's uh, it takes to make business so they sell uh, a version of LibreOffice which has uh, uh, some added value for the for the user, which is usually an enterprise user, and uh, this uh, is the uh, the model, the sustainability model of the project. So we there's no one uh, injecting money into the project. Uh, there are many. Uh, we are over half a million uh, people that have decided to donate to the project over time. Uh, and there are uh, uh, companies, organizations, universities, uh, enterprises uh, of any kind that are uh, uh, paying companies to uh, develop uh, a specific uh, feature or a specific uh, version for vertical uh, applications or a specific uh, uh, personalization of LibreOffice. And uh, the money that they pay to these companies is uh, used to pay developers that are uh, developing uh, the LibreOffice uh, uh, core uh, technology. So uh, the, the model is working, uh, of course, uh, we are always trying to improve it because uh, the market around us, uh, the environment is changing. But let's say that so far it's uh, the, 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 the model has worked uh, and uh, I don't see why with the, uh, with the, an evolution of the model, it shouldn't work in the future. So um, there is really nothing uh, funny or controversial or ironic about uh, t what we call it TDF, uh, uh, the Document Foundation. Of course, uh, if uh, you look at the organization without any understanding of open source, uh, it will, it will uh, uh, first uh, impact will be kind of uh, how the hell they can uh, work together this way uh there is a lot of discipline uh, working together based in uh, different uh, continents different countries different time zones uh we don't have a, a single office in the world there are people working in their own office but the document foundation has a p.o box that's all uh, in terms of uh, physical uh, office uh, that we have and in, it's funny because every now and then we get an email because the PO box is in Berlin we get an email from people say oh hey I'm in Berlin next uh, next next week I would like to meet your team and we say actually there's no one in Berlin we have our lawyer basically is, uh, is in Berlin but there's no one in Berlin and the closest one to is 400 miles from Berlin, uh, the closest German that lives there. I'm based in Italy, but we have people in Taiwan, Japan, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, New Zealand. Uh, we have people everywhere. And uh, they're contributing uh, to the same project, coordinating each other with uh, chat lines, uh, emails, uh, um it's it's just another or a different way of doing uh, business uh, uh, which is interesting and a lot of fun you mentioned um that things have been evolving or changing um i guess uh in i, I either online or in terms of open source community i'm not sure exactly what you're referencing but could you discuss the way in which things have been evolving and changing and, and what the implications thereof we, for we, TDF. we have um, uh, as i said before we have uh, different competitors when we started uh, basically our 
competitor was Microsoft Office and uh, the market was on the desktop. Uh, cloud uh, uh, Office Suite were uh, just a, mm, a tiny percentage of, uh, of the market. And uh, the same uh, was for Mobile Office Suite. Yes, there were uh, uh, on, on mobile, there were a small application that allow you to to edit a document, but it was nothing in comparison with the feature of, a, of an office suite. Uh, this uh, in, uh, in two around 2010. In 2020, we have uh, Microsoft Office, uh, with the cloud version Office 365. We have Google Docs, which is uh, very well known and established uh, in almost every country. We have uh, other uh, uh, niche players or uh, um, um, open uh, free Office Suite. For instance, there is a Chinese product called WPS Office. It's a freeware. Freeware means that the license is free, but the, the software is uh, proprietary, so you don't have any source code uh, accessible. We have uh, uh, only Office, which is a product from um, uh, Russia. It's open core. That means that the... Uh, the, the the central uh, the kernel of the software is open source but most of the uh, modules uh, around the kernel are proprietary uh, so we have uh, uh, the, the the environment around us has changed uh, there are uh, there, there are um, more competitors uh, some of these competitors have a um, geographical uh, uh, presence not uh, not everywhere for instance WPS office is very strong in China and uh, and uh, and the Far East but almost not known in Europe uh, and uh, in the States uh, while uh, only office is a European product so is more known in Europe uh, and is less known in Asia and and um, the Americas uh, Google Docs is known everywhere. So the, the, the implication is that we, we have the challenge to keep up with the, with the competitors. So we have a challenge of uh, either developing or uh, finding uh, someone in the ecosystem who is able to develop a product to be in in that market of course uh, because of the way we manage the project uh, in some cases we are a little bit uh, slow to react for instance uh, uh, mobile uh, we 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 didn't have uh, a real mobile uh, um, application uh, until uh, 2019 because uh, we we had a basic application that was not really we were not really proud of uh, and uh, none of the ecosystem uh, companies uh, was investing on that while uh, in 2018 uh, one of these companies started to invest and in uh, early 2019 announced the product which is called Collabora Office, uh, is available for Android, is also available for uh, um, iOS, but I think, uh, I'm not an expert of that market, I think only for the iPad, not for the iPhone. Uh, and uh, that's more or less the, the challenges that we, are, uh, that we are facing. Of course, uh, who knows what will happen in the next 10 years? Um, and uh, just to make a very uh, actual uh, comment, uh, 
during uh, the lockdown in Europe, we had a, we almost doubled the downloads because the number of people using an office suite at home, either for work from home or for uh, uh, distance learning, uh, increased dramatically. Many people and not the money to buy Microsoft Office, so many people decided to install LibreOffice. So we had to discuss that further. Yeah, please discuss the lockdown, the effect of downloads on um, LibreOffice. Yeah. And is the only reason users would use TDF or uh, LibreOffice because it's free, or are there other reasons? Um, I think uh, that the main reason uh, was because it's free and it's full feature. Uh, of course, uh, you have to consider that LibreOffice is not only free, but is full feature. So when when you say full feature means uh, if you can do something with Microsoft Office, 98% uh, uh, you can do the same with LibreOffice, which is, uh, uh, of course, important, especially for people working uh, in uh, in enterprises because they cannot risk uh, to open a document uh, and not being able to edit uh, uh, it because it's either too long uh, or uh, with uh, you know and uh, notes uh, or uh, three columns uh, or whatever so libreoffice uh, is uh, the office suite uh, which better uh, emulates if you want but as i told uh, we are not emulating because we were born at the same time so we we just developed according to user needs uh, and as the user needs are very similar everywhere at the end we we realized that we develop more or less the same features and uh, so we are uh, uh, is free is full feature uh, it's solid, robust, it's uh, extremely um, um, secure, uh, especially if you look at the um, at these uh, uh, software that are uh, not developed with a, with some security strategy behind. Uh, we we give uh, a lot of attention to security and uh, in fact uh, LibreOffice uh, uh, if uh, you look at the statistics for uh, vulnerabilities uh, is the, uh, the the office suite which has less uh, vulnerabilities which means uh, that has less uh, as, as the smaller surface of of attack uh, for people uh, uh, using uh, viruses, Trojans, uh, um, and all this kind of, uh, you know, ransomware and uh, all this kind of uh, yeah, malware. Uh, and I don't think I, I don't see any uh, any other real uh, real uh, motivation. I think this latter motivation you might be underestimating how much people are interested in this. Like for instance, Google Documents is free today, but I'm on LibreOffice because I think that it might be more secure. So could you speak to the security of LibreOffice and and why it's such a strength? Um, the main reason why uh, LibreOffice is a, is a product that has a high level of security and of course, uh, we should be clear here. Uh, you, the the software, a software which is one hundred percent secure, will never exist because uh, the software is developed by humans. Human make mistakes uh, when they develop the software, and therefore uh, uh, each mistake uh, uh, leaves uh, some. Uh, some space open to people that want to leverage the software for uh, attacking uh, the user. So LibreOffice uh, is not 100% secure, uh, but for um, 
several reasons, and uh, I will try to avoid uh, becoming too technical, but um, we uh, first, uh, our source code uh, is public, which means uh, that uh, we are helped by many security specialists that, of course, uh, share our own vision, uh, who uh, are helping us uh, in uh, improving the security of the software. They look into the code to find uh, uh, this kind uh, of uh, potential issues. They are, uh, these people are called, uh, usually defined as ethical hackers. Uh, so they are people that uh, use their skills not to attack the users, but to help the users. Uh, and especially help the users to avoid being a victim of uh, uh, malware. So this is the first, uh, our first level. The second one is that our developers um, use uh, a number of tools, uh, which are uh, usually uh, tools that you have to pay for, but are often uh, made available for free to, to open source project that are tools that uh, are uh, automatically looking for, uh, for potential issues. And uh, we use these tools uh, uh, to, to spot the issues. And then uh, we have a number of uh, developers uh, who are going, are looking into the issues. Some of the issues may be false positives, so no issue, but some of them may be real ones. And then of this, of course, uh, having a, a software that helps uh, to scan the open source, the, the LibreOffice source code on a, on a weekly basis helps uh, quite a lot. Last, we are uh, extremely transparent uh, when it comes uh, to um, publish our uh, uh, security bulletins, which means that we are not shy about security. Uh, we make it public uh, exactly because uh, we want uh, to, it's a way of uh, saying thanks to all the people that help us uh, in, uh, in maintaining the security and is a way to show to the users that uh, um, even if the user may not be a security specialist uh, and actually the number of users that have uh, um, that are knowledgeable about security is extremely limited but the fact that we are transparent uh, shows to users that we are not afraid of uh, of talking, uh, speaking about security, we are not afraid of uh, covering security. Uh, of course, as I said uh, before, uh, security, 100% security does not exist. This is one of the reasons why we don't use security as part of our uh, communication and marketing, uh, because uh, we know that uh, is uh, potentially a risky, a very risky environment. Now, in conclusion, could you speak to the, the present day and LibreOffice and, you know, the lockdowns and the effects that has had on uh, kind of uh, the open source community even? And this can be in conclusion. Yeah, uh, we, we will be announcing uh, a new version in early August. It's going to be version 7.0. And uh, so we, we keep uh, releasing uh, based on our, uh, uh, on our uh, uh, schedule. We decided to have a time-based schedule, so every six months in early February and early August, we release a, a, a new version of the software. And uh, the impact that we had on, on, uh, on open source, uh, uh, of course, if you look at the, 
At the Linux environment, uh, the impact of LibreOffice has been uh, dramatic because uh, we can uh, we can uh, really say that almost 100% of Linux users are uh, uh, LibreOffice users. And uh, uh, it looks like Linux is uh, growing uh, also because of the lockdown has grown more during the last uh, 12 months than during the previous 10 years. Uh, some people are starting to realize that uh, there are uh, advantages in, in, in using Linux, although there is uh, or there might be a, a steep or a some learning curve. Uh, it's not as steep as it was in the past, but let's say that, of course, is a is a different operating system. Uh, but it's an operating system, for instance, uh, where uh, security issues are uh, not absent, uh, but extremely uh, low. And uh, uh, the the robustness of the software is incredibly uh, strong. Uh, on the other operating system, uh, we we have a rather large number of users, but of course, uh, the scenario today is extremely fragmented, and uh, especially with. Uh, young generations uh, it's uh, difficult uh, uh, to uh, to get their interest on a software on a desktop software they they were used uh, or they are used to 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 touch uh, and, and therefore to to smartphones uh, one of the effect effect of covid of course has been that uh, young people have ha have been forced to stay in front of a real computer and not of a of a screen of just a screen which is uh, on one side positive and on the other is not positive because they've not been uh, trained uh, in the right way to do that so they've been uh, we can say they've been parachuted on on a, on a keyboard instead of being uh, uh, being educated to use the computer and the keyboard uh, as a tool uh, and especially as a as a key tool uh, for their digital uh, for their digital future so uh, we are happy about the impact of LibreOffice of course uh, uh, we would be even happier if the impact was uh, stronger but Let's say that we 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 are um, we are very close to our uh, initial dream. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening, and thank you so much, Italo Vignole, for talking about LibreOffice and the Document Foundation today. I think that open source software and alternative technology in general is something that everyone should become familiar with. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for inviting me and bye-bye. Uh,